Thank you so much. Glad to be here. So I'm sure we've all heard it all. Yeah. Each one of us is intimate with what is. Yeah. Each one of us is the summation of all that is and already formless, already unconditioned, already everywhere present, already deeply wise. Yeah. So what a play this is where innocence goes on a great quest for treasure. Our culture loves wisdom. Our culture sniffs it out wherever it is in, in arts, in science, anywhere we can find it. Somehow we have this idea that mm, uncovering wisdom or knowledge equals value in our society, in our uh, tribe, then we will get some respect, finally. So ever since we're five years old, at least in the States, off to school we go, learning, learning, learning. A little bit of play is thrown in there just to keep us content. So this is the great quest, the great quest. And the funny thing is none of us were ever the seeker. It actually was the glorious genius mind that was looking for great wisdom, great freedom. Just because it was in too small a space and it never got enough respect. And it could read every book written in all the languages and still hunger for more. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. So because the mind is formless, yeah, it can hold so much information. And since it's vast enough, it can mm, hold differing points of view. So anyhow, it has a lot of fun going on this great quest. However, it's trained to look and measure objects. The mind is trained to notice objects, to compare them, to measure them, you know, points of view, belief systems, sciences. Now, this quest is really fun because it can't win. <laughs> it's looking for something that's formless, everywhere present, absolutely neutral and transparent, with no distinctions, it's not in time. So this is a great conundrum because it'll have experiences of vastness, uncluttered, open, spaceless space, but then it makes it into an experience. Oh, that was really cool. And then it'll say, yeah, but that wasn't as great as in 1977 when we were listening to The Grateful Dead. So it'll compare and then it'll assign this naturalness to the past. So we're really today going to really honor the genius mind. It's the supreme intelligence in too small a space. It requires relaxation to notice uncluttered vastness, to notice the Mm, the intelligence that doesn't come or go, to notice the peace that doesn't come or go. So when we honor the mind, which is very unusual in our culture, we use it, but we don't honor it. When we pause for a moment and say thank you to all that practical, creative intelligence, even if it was in seeking and driving us nuts or defending us and driving us nuts, we just pause for a moment and say thank you to it. It's very surprised when it gets respect because it thought it had to earn it. It had to get the postdoctoral or had to write the 10 bestsellers or it had to make billions of dollars. <laughs> And it still wouldn't get any respect <laughs> that it had to become president. And oh man, that was not a good idea. So 
<laughs> All it ever wanted was to be honored for no reason, really. That's the yummy respect. Or you're walking down the street and an apparent stranger just nods at you. Yeah, that respect for no reason. Inclusion for no reason. Mm -hmm. So then when the mind pauses for a moment, it's nice to ask it to uncontain itself. Because when we look into little babies, eyes, their mind is uncontained. They haven't contracted to focus or figure anything out or concentrate or collect data. They're just having so much fun. <laughs> so then we go to school and they invite us to concentrate and focus and you actually get in trouble if you don't, if you stay vast and empty and look out the window and gaze <laughs> like all sages do, that's not okay. So that's the only problem with the mind is it learned to contract to function. And then especially when the stakes are very high, it has to concentrate even more, focus even more. So we're just inviting the mind to rest. If this that it was seeking is everywhere present and not in time, and already here, let's see if that's true. Let's see if that's true that the mind is that, that the body is made of that. This unmoving, intelligent, no thing, whatever you want to call it, life. But everything has to stop being a greyhound. Just for a second, all the greyhounds can sit on their haunches and sniff the air. The race has been run. An elder greyhound has come along and said, hey, it's already here. So we're just seeing if that's true. Taking off the lenses of contraction and focus and concentration, taking off the lenses, belief system and doubt into something very unadorned, something very transparent and neutral and already here at the heart of everything. Most games involve the winner is the one that ran the fastest or threw the ball the hardest. Mm. But this one, the game only allows full revelation upon resting. Who would have thunk it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so really honoring this mind. The mind as intelligence is already formless. That which is formless cannot be conditioned, can't be imprinted. So it's already free, the mind. It just needs to stretch. Just needs a big stretch into the space around the head. <laughs> Why not? It's been cooped up way too long. It's like having a galaxy in your cranium. So let it stretch. Let it like, ah, unfurl, stretch. Osho said in 10 directions in the body. Out of the head, behind the back, deep into the earth, wherever it likes. This is the pleasure of freedom, the uncontaining, the not being cooped up. Mm. Hmm. Already limitless, 
the mind is already unbound. Yeah, already unbound. So what it was looking for <clears throat> was just vast space, but an alive, sparkling, spaceless space. Now the curious noticing is that here it is, everything's made of it. But then the mind can say, yeah, but where's the uh, enlightenment? Where is the luminosity? Where is that light of 10,000 suns? But we're looking for that which doesn't come or go, which is disguised as ordinary. How wonderful it is to look a little deeper behind form and function into the heart of everything, the heart of the mind, the heart of the body, the heart of wisdom, the heart of space. So freedom is not freedom from, it's freedom with. Here we are, life itself, already all welcoming, already all pervading, mm -hmm. already the love that doesn't come or go, that which animates everything, looks out of everyone's eyes, mm -hmm. already has absolute value, never even heard of anything less than that, never even heard of absolute value. Never even heard of enlightenment. Like what? <laughs> oh my goodness. Such a relief. So the super doer, which was very noble, he was our superhero. The questing, seeking mind. That one gets to take its cape off. Take its superhero outfit off. And return to its majesty and dignity just as the supreme intelligence, which is much more fun. There's no performing anymore, no having to get anything right, no having to play a role, even a spiritual role, that would be extra boring and dry. Ah. <laughs> and now we also honor the body. The body is a genius. There's an immeasurable intelligence. You know, the five elements. So each one of us is wearing the five elements. Yeah. Five elements already, already liberated. Hmm? Not subject to death. Not even subject to birth. So when we also honor the body as the five elements, as the great mystery that makes everything, that animates everything, then the body also can rest. Poor body, it was pushed around by the mahout in the head. Mahout are the ones that ride the great elephant and poke it with sharp sticks. So the great elephant can also rest, noble one, five elements, absolutely free, also unconditioned, doesn't have to play the role of any uh, nationality, any apparent race, any belief system, any religion. And we honor all the uniqueness of life in consciousness. And yet it's nice to set aside all the costumes and all the roles, even the role of aging. Oh, yay. <laughs> yeah, so what a mystery. What a mystery. So what I really liked about realizing I was awareness or a liquid, formless, intelligent presence that wasn't a thing or an object, is that then I started to notice nothing else was. So the tree 
has an immeasurable intelligence and presence. And that actually anything that is animated by this is not subject to death. The form is subject to death. Yeah. But not this sparkling essence, it's quirky and... <laughs> Oh, gosh. So here we're free from even all beliefs about freedom. Yeah. And it's spontaneous. So I like to call all of us modern sages. Though we've benefited from all the traditions and all the insights of the elder sages. Mm. Each one of us modern sages, we've benefited from being out in nature and noticing what is the depths of relaxation in the forests and the mountains and in the animal kingdom and in the rivers and in the evening sky. We've all noticed that and our bodies remembered not just a human. So, so restful so restful to lay all the burdens down and just be even the superhero to super doer realizes that in being there's unshakable value all the wisdom is stored in stillness it doesn't have to be accumulated or read or hmm, quoted So we're even resting from the burden of wisdom. Mm. <laughs> even though it's fun to pull things out of the magician's hat inside. That's super fun. Mm. Mm. And as all languages do, they relax back into just sound. Then all sound relaxes back into stillness. And even all Dharma talks, satsangs, <laughs> eventually sages run out of words, <laughs> which is actually a relief <laughs> for all involved. I could read from a recipe book, <laughs> my favorite recipes. Okay. Somehow I'm being quiet now. Hmm. Hmm. So Pamela, um, can I ask you a, a question? Sure. Okay. Um, actually, it's a quote that I read, um, and I'd like to get your, your take on it. But um, mm -hmm. you, you said, be really tender with thought. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Okay. See, none of the defenses or anything that has shielded or armored or contracted around itself um, can maintain any of those survival strategies in the face of tenderness, in the face of respect or kindness. And this is based on a pointer from Papaji that actually I almost fell off my chair when I read it was look within, approach everything with devotion and gratitude, and then stay as heart. Before I was in a seek and destroy mission, undercover as a nice, kind, spiritual lady. <laughs> I was looking for any conditioning, any belief system, any contractions, any uh, non-love, any, oh, I was fiercely martial, warlike in my quest for peace. So that gives us a, a little clue. Bodies don't like that. <laughs> and the mind doesn't like disrespect. So then when I went in bowing, everything bowed back. I was going, ooh, good, this works. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. 
That's great. You earlier you said um, you were talking about the the cranium as this container, and and the freedom of, of opening it up. And, and um, I got this sense of container equals control. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there are, uh, and then lack of control can bring fear. Mm -hmm. So in that in that. Uh, some people use the word surrender. I didn't hear that. I heard more of a freedom, like of an allowing um, kind of phrasing there. But um, talk, talk a little bit about um, that, uh, the, the being open to that loss of control. Because once it's seen, once that freedom is seen, it, uh, it doesn't matter what it took to get there. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but there's always these, you know, it, I would say it's a wall, but you know, it could be road speed bumps along the way where, um, that, that feeling of a lack of control might create anxiety or fear or, or a, a resistance to proceed. Yeah. And, and lack of control is another great myth as is control. So if, if you feel into it, all it is, is a contraction in the body and in the head. You know, the, the looking for control, the first movement is to contract, to shield, to defend. And, and then the genius in the head starts, you know, running survival tests, you know, and survival scenarios and survival strategies. And it, it's like when you, even after the shift, sometimes it'll offer those you know, helpful <laughs> services. And so I used to go, uh, excuse me, God, what are you doing up there? Because <laughs> I sort of saw initially everything was divine, you know, and now I see everything as, as space and intelligence. But they're really honoring a lot of the things we try and get rid of are survival gifts. They are given by life to itself, to its own embodiment, you know, this keen awareness, this capacity to, you know, gaze and scan, and then the amazing interpretive functions and comparing functions like, oh, last time this happened, there was not a good ending. So we have to contract more and run away faster. So if I just start thanking all the survival tendencies, because that longing for control is just wanting to get through the day, wanting to get through this uncomfortable circumstance or dangerous circumstance. So I just really honor survival. It's like what a passionate, passionate play and gift. And when I honor survival, then all the other mm, kind of roots and branches of that they can rest. They go, oh, good. Because <laughs> only a sage would honor the weird stuff. You see, so it sends a second signal. You know, if I really bow to a very mm, senile movement to defend, it, it subsides. If I try and control it back and push against it, then it has to get more armaments, you know? So it's just, and the sweet thing is like, wow, the only, um, it's looking for survival because it hasn't noticed that who it is is eternal. Even the body, it dies, but it doesn't die as the five elements. Once my body saw that, it went, oh, excellent, good, we're cool. <laughs> and once the mind notices it's the supreme immeasurable intelligence and also not subject to death because it's formless everybody gets to relax because control would be like a booby prize you either get to be eternal or you get to have some small measure of control <laughs> so i'm all for being eternal it's very relaxing <laughs> great yeah eternal is much better <laughs> um all right so there's a there's a, a common phrase uh live your best life Ooh. you know or part of our culture and, and and programming is is uh obviously in in marketing and the media and 
telling us that we should be something other than what we are. But uh, I'd lo love your take on that phrase, live your best life. The only reason it resonates for everyone is because the other part of the play of formlessness is fullness. And before the body and the mind contained, there was um, sort of a grown up phrase, direct access to the fullness of every moment. You know, it was passionate. It's like, oh, the sandbox was glorious. I mean, this is epic. Everything was epic. And then what happened is concepts and contracting and role play. It's kind of like wearing a heavy winter coat at the beach in summer. Everything got dulled down. Yeah. So the reason friends can get a little hooked is because there is a longing to return to the fullness, to the enjoying, to the passion, to the creativity, to the enjoying life. Life is amazing. That which the great mystery, whoever, <laughs> no one who made life, is all designed for enjoyment, even contrast, cold, Relaxing into springtime, relaxing into summer, relaxing into fall. That's contrast. And when you relax into contrast, there's pleasure. Yeah. So we're, that's all anyone wants is to return to their naturalness. You know, and then some people call it enlightenment, but that's unnatural. <laughs> oh. So fullness, I'm all for enjoying. I mean, even though in deep relaxation, you can be sitting in a chair watching a bird at a bird bath and be totally riffing on that. Yeah, and, and that, makes, that makes sense. And then some also say, yeah, well, that's, that's easy if you're comfortable sitting watching the bird. Um, I'm suffering. Yes. I'm um, feeling suffering. What, what do I do um, mm -hmm. to, 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 to get to the point where viewing that bird brings me this yes. deep relaxation? Yeah. yeah, so we all, as soon as you're in form, you're going to need shelter and food and have an affinity for safety. So that really helps if we all have that. And so we're bowing to the friends who don't have that. Um, but basically the key is, and athletes know this, this is not rocket science, is that to help your body mind unwind and return to its naturalness. So the key to, if there is suffering is to notice you're that which is aware of the suffering. And most of us can confirm that, wow, that suffering is too big to be ours. That's very helpful because then you go, oh, this isn't my suffering. You know, there's all these fun psychological, oh, this was my great aunt's or the, it doesn't matter whose it was, you are aware of it. <laughs> now the key is nothing will come sit with us unless we have medicine for it not personal medicine, but in our naturalness is this compassion that's already all welcoming. So even though it's sincere that we're not gonna like suffering, haven't met anyone who has, but notice if you invite it a little closer and have a little compassion for it, and it helps when you remember, oh, this is not mine. This is the human tribe suffering, or this is the forest suffering, or yeah. And then that helps because otherwise suffering is going to keep pestering you because <laughs> you're the designated sage it found. It goes, oh, this one has a good heart. I'm going to plunk myself down on their heart until it... I rest. Mm. Makes sense. Yeah, the uh, uh, the gra gratitude for suffering later 
um, in, in some cases is, mm -hmm. is wonderful and, and in other cases uh, it can create more suffering, mm -hmm. uh, re reiterating on that story of when it happened. Um, so I have a question from, uh, from the audience. How, how do you access, or how does one, I'll put it that way, access and process trauma stored unconsciously in the body? Yeah, same thing. It's, it's very curious. The welcoming that, um, that Papaji suggested, look within, approach everything with devotion and gratitude. Trauma is also not what it appears to be. Now, trauma is the body storing a shock or harshness, the response to it, um, because it never wants that to happen again. And it's like a, the body is saying, we didn't like it the first time and we never want that to happen again. So it tightens around it to remind itself. Now, this is very innocent and, and I'm saying this respectfully, it's primitive. So if we honor trauma, and it's also everything has beingness in it. Everything is made of space. Everything is made of innocent, open presence. Great sutra from Shankara, everything is consciousness. So we're honoring trauma as that. Then it'll start to shape shift and start to open and then we honor that because that's an act of amazing courage to open. Then we just stay with it. Keep bowing to its willingness to be here despite human harshness, disrespect. And we just keep bowing to it. And then I like to ask Ramana's great question, which he used to invite folks to ask, who am I? But now we ask, who are you, trauma? Who were you before that history? Before all human history, I would suggest that within all human forms is human history as well. So we're just bowing to it before human history before you contracted to record that happening you didn't like, who are you? And not knowing is very natural. I think not knowing is <laughs> how it is. And then before not knowing, who are you, trauma? There's such a clue in that word, trauma. It has OM in it, A-U-M like ah oh, that is the that which got touched by disrespect and harshness and history and shock that is the most tender one pure presence pure beingness yeah pure space so we go hello hello in there <laughs> and how wise it was to contract and defend itself very wise Thank you. All right, we have another question. Okay, <clears throat> it says, uh, Birkin says, suffering does not need to be an apparent suffering. Any experience repeated enough turns into suffering. Mm. Buddha calls it change suffering, which we all inherently have as a natural state of our mind. Any comments on change suffering would be appreciated. Yeah, it's so simple. We're back to the respect again. If I bow to what you're calling and what the Buddha called change suffering, it'll start to shape shift because everything's made of formlessness and it's just embedded, so to speak, or recorded or um, imprinted for to play the human role. Yeah, so once the costume subsides and the I thought comes to rest, and the, uh, then we can bow to that because it's our it's the human backstory, really. 
and it lends depth to character if neither or any of us had any um, imprinted or contained um, human history, we wouldn't be credible actors. Nobody would believe us. They go, ah, uh, nah, they're just presents, you know? Yeah, great. No, but then there's a full body embodiment of that kind of suffering. And then you can feel it if you walk by someone in the grocery store. So we're just honoring that. That's another, another gift. Oddly enough, even if you sit with suffering long enough, it can shred all conditioning, all containment, all sense of deficient sense of self, all sense of self. So it's very curious, all these gifts. But I like to bow first and then inquire. Mm. I like that. So as you can imagine, a lot of questions come in about relationships, mm. not necessarily romantic relationships, but um, uh, how, how do you, I guess I'll phrase it a different way, but it's how do you relate to another that isn't awake? I would add to that. How do you relate to uh, another that is, I guess, not aware of this, this message? Very um, good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you're you're still with the same being, the same beingness. It you know, awake asleep is still in role play. So we want to bow to whoever is behind you know role play. And this was my great pleasure for the first few years afterwards. After the aha, the return. It was like, oh, I walk into a grocery store and there would be somebody, you know, totally in the role of cashier, like bored. I don't want to be here, you know. I don't like my job, you know. And I'd walk in and I'd go into a deep bow inside. Not saying a word, I'd sort of smile. But their back would straighten, the shoulders would go back. So this is, it's the namaste. I honor whatever we want to call it, life within you, the divine in you. I honor you as presence. That's all anybody ever wanted, to be honored for no reason. Yeah. So that, to me, relaxes the awake asleep. It relaxes role play. It relaxes ancient arguments. It really... <laughs> Yeah, so it's fun. And the best thing is don't tell them you're doing it because otherwise their defenses will be alerted. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Well, you, when you, you said, you know, everyone wants to be honored uh, in an earlier talk, uh, I get this, everyone wants to be seen in that same way, that namaste. Yeah. Uh, in an earlier talk, um, Cheryl Abram was talking about an experiment where the the mother would sit in front of the baby and would go like this and couldn't make any faces, you know, it just had to be, it sounded like torture for a mother. I think that that experiment, you know, being <laughs> not making, not responding and mm -hmm. how the baby would just get more and more upset and crying. Um, and you get the sense that they were all of a sudden there they weren't being seen. Like what's going on here. I, yeah. I can see, I can see mom is there. Um, and, uh, you can see that, 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 that there's something deep seated in us that wants that seeing, that wants to be seen uh, in that regard. Um, mm -hmm. But then that connection of the, that connection of the sight, making eye contact with someone. But I, yes. I love that you just said, don't, don't let them know you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's sweet because it's, it's just, it's actually the law of nature is respect. And as soon as there's no respect, everything gets out of balance. Yeah. So there, are, there's always the the what's it, what was it like for you? What is it like for you? Um, type of questions 
um, mm -hmm. are you always like this? Is, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, um, I, I get secondhand smoke off of everyone. So I get, <laughs> I get a little extra joyous and irreverent. And, but no, you know, bodies are the same all bodies we they come with the same movements we and they're their gifts the emotional body is is a gift it colors our experience and um then we have the mind interpreting all those emotional movements and experiences but it it really is for me i remember the first time i walked into a grocery store and the body didn't do shields up before the body would contract as soon as it would go into any sort of public space or when it was around people before i the body could be rooted and relaxed in nature if there were no people around but it's it's now that i know that oh people are nature <laughs> The people are the same. And actually the most amazing insight was like, oh, we're all the same. It doesn't matter this whole awake asleep business. Everybody has the same longings as soon as you're an embodiment. Pretty much the same affinities. Yeah. And so that and everybody is already this. So that changes everything how I walk about. You know, it's not like I go to a satsang to sit with a sage. Everywhere you go, there, there are sages. Do you know, it doesn't matter if they know it or not. More fun for them. <laughs> they get to find out. Yay! <laughs> yeah, Ravana Maharshi said the, 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 the guru is everywhere. It, yeah. can be any, it can be anything. Okay. Um, well, speaking of satsangs, you know, holding them, is a perfect recipe for the repetition of answers to the same questions. Yeah. What, um, what's, a, what's the most common question that, I, I hate to make you do it again if it's something that you always have, but what's the most common question that comes up? Well, it's not so much, if, if there's any restlessness in the embodiment, it's usually doubt in the head or the emotional body also wanting to know its true nature. The funny thing is because the I thought says I, and until you notice you're the listener and not the thinker, then there'll be this idea that, um, oh, that's my thought and that's how I feel, but it's actually not true. So it's kind of fun to watch the movement of doubt go, oh, there you are again. <laughs> Because doubt has super high standards for embodiment and wakefulness, whereas the body and naturalness have very low standards for it in a good way. Yeah, so I just invite folks to notice the movements and notice the fact that there's restlessness just is because there's a longing for that aspect in consciousness to come to rest be it the emotions or the head or yeah that makes sense and and those those aspects of doubt after glimpses or awakenings or whatever you want to call it pop in i think it was papaji that said that that it's like a fan that continues going until it just rests or other people call it oscillation you know that back and forth um the the mind has spent so much time uh running the show so to speak, that uh, it's not that it necessarily stops, might keep making those attempts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You just say, good job, good job. <laughs> yeah, there you go, pat it on the head. <laughs> That's right. But it's sweet, especially as modern sages, we're not going to be cookie cutter, so we can't be compared to another sage, right? We're all so quirky, which I love that. That's great. All right, let me look for another question here. Okay. Um, comments on the quote, uh, 
the mind is not the enemy, but it's a horrible consultant. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> That's adorable. Yeah, you don't, it's, it's fascinating if you really slow down and really watch the movements. For instance, it's your instrument of identification, the one who writes the screenplay for your role play character that is looking for so-called enlightenment because it has very high standards. Now, then it looks through identification to try and find non-identification. So when you start to like really keenly go, oh, look at that, look at that. Oh, that's the I thought apparently running the show, and that's so beautifully said, the play, the theater, and now it wants freedom. And it, the reason it wants freedom is natural because it just wants relief and space and to rest and feel like it has value. But then it goes on a great, as we all can remember, it goes on this big odyssey just to go back to the garden where it never left. That's great. So we have some more time. Um, there is a, there has been a, uh, a statement, a phrase that's been used as we've been putting all this together. Um, uh, that's basically you can't you can't do this incorrectly. You can't, <laughs> you can't do this wrong, you know. And 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 yet uh, it, this this is pretty has been pretty ambitious. Everyone all over the planet, you know, talking. Um, I'd love to hear your comments on that, that phrase, you know, you can do no wrong or you can't do this incorrectly. Yeah, and are we speaking of life in general or seeking or? I would, yeah, I would just say life in general. I mean, obviously we're, we're talking about it. We're, when it comes up, people are saying it about life, but it's usually on the team. It's in the context of, well, yeah. I don't know, you know, you can't do this incorrectly. So let's see what happens. Oh, good. Uh, but, That's but life in general would be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, our culture, and I don't know about other cultures, um, really admires skillfulness and perfection and, you know, success and all these very important things, but nobody honors bumbling along. Do you know what I mean? And bumbling is as mm, intelligent and skillful as you know the the road the straight road bumbling you bumble over here no there's a no you then you bumble back that way and oh that's good let's keep bumbling this way and then you bumble over there nope <laughs> so sometimes i think of life uh as you know those old uh ping pong not ping pong pinball machines so you have these two little levers and they're called attachment and aversion or liking and not liking. So here's innocence bumbling along and then there's a, you know, it's going to go over here to where it likes and then a little aversion will bop it over back on the, <laughs> where it's supposed to go. So you really can't get it wrong. And it might be a long windy road, which makes for better views. <laughs> Not a straight one, but what to do? That's you great. Left and you, so you don't really return, but there's lots of odysseys and stories and anecdotes. Mm -hmm. So um, someone asked, I would like to ask about surrender. Mm -hmm. Can you demystify it? Is it a happening or the apparent one could do anything in a direction of surrendering? Mm. Well, you know, we'll all have affinities for different pointers. I never had an affinity for that pointer surrender. <laughs> Maybe because <laughs> I was trying to fight my way back to peace. <laughs> but surrender, all these words like welcoming and surrender and laying your burden down, they're all pointing to something really simple, which is relaxation. When there's relaxation, the mind opens, the body opens. So all the lenses that we usually look through and experience, they all relax. And then there's just an honest 
simple meeting of what is. So that all those fancy words, they're just about who you already are. You don't get any more surrendered than allowing the mind to boss you around. You don't get any more surrendered to have everything, all phenomena, all emotions, moving through your living room called the torso. I mean, if you look at it, we're actually, we're actually surrender itself because we're spaceless space. Everything is granted free access to us, every experience. And then the defenses, they just contract because they're trying to hold phenomena out of this all welcoming space. But everything is happening behind the guards. So it's kind of embarrassing when you see all this. So <laughs> I would just rest, don't surrender. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, that is an interesting word. And I, um, when you were talking earlier, I, it makes sense that it's not one that that's preferred. I love your, your take on it about fighting your way through it because there's no surrender, you know, never give up. <laughs> good. Oh. So um, we have a, we have a couple more minutes. Um, I would say, uh, is there anything that you'd like to tell, um, tell the audience about anything that you have coming up? I mean, we have your, your profile information. Uh, on the well, it's more important for folks to just pause and honor themselves because it's such a taboo in our culture here you know, we're running around doing namaste to everyone else but has anyone ever done a namaste inside to the great mystery to this emptiness openness stillness naturalness so that that's my thing. If you honor yourself, I mean, Muktananda said, he said, love yourself for God dwells in you as you. I remember hearing that when I was a kid and I sat with Muktananda and I went, how do you love yourself? Because the training is so much from the I thought not to love ourselves. So anyhow, I'm saying a couple of inner bows, invite everything to rest and you're good as gold. <laughs> <laughs> that's great yeah it's a it's a common it, there are so many common phrases about it you can't how can you love anyone or anything else until you love yourself and yet like you said that um that, that programming is just sort mm -hmm. of anti that um mm -hmm. that's that's a great pointer mm -hmm. um on that note do you have any do you have any other favorite pointers um the, the one really from Robert Adams that nothing is what it appears to be, that blew me away because then I had, I'm, I'm very snoopy. I really had to go look. Really? It's also convincingly what it appears to be. And then we get the labeling function where, oh, that's a tree. And then that's a, you know, so that was, see, they're invitations, these pointers, just to look a little deeper. So. And then it makes life fun. You can be in your car in a traffic jam and you're going, really? That person isn't who they appear to be. They sure look like a jerk. <laughs> oh my goodness. You can have a lot of fun wherever you are. Hmm. Very true. Okay. Well, I really appreciate your time. It was so good talking to you. Likewise.